So one day, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding, so they named a telescope after him. Well, yeah, there's more to the story. Now, imagine a fruitcake baking in the oven. As this cake is rising, the raisins inside are moving farther apart. Something similar happens when the universe expands. But instead of raisins, there are galaxies, which start to spread out. That's why if you randomly pick any two galaxies, the chances are they're moving away from each other. But then the question is, if galaxies are moving apart, why are there still galactic collisions? You see, even while expanding, the universe still remains a playground for galaxies to interact with one another. And they mostly do it by using gravity. All galaxies out there attract other galaxies, and their mutual pull slows down the speed of them moving apart. And naturally, the closer two galaxies are to each other, the stronger their mutual gravitational pull is. On a large scale, it doesn't seem to make any difference, since every galaxy experiences a similar pull in every direction. But locally, gravity kind of overwhelms this powerful cosmic expansion and pulls together two or more galaxies which were initially moving apart. That's how galaxy collisions occur. Plus, some galaxy groups, like the Virgo cluster, aren't expanding at the moment, since local gravity has stopped the expansion process in that region. Some large galaxies can attract smaller ones, and then the gravity of the larger galaxy starts pulling a smaller one toward it. Eventually, it leads to a collision. Galaxies are made up of stars, rock, dust, gas, and other materials. When two galaxies collide, their gases begin to interact. These gases usually exist in large clouds spread throughout galaxy systems. Because of their size, large clouds of gases are more likely to run into large clouds of gases. Then they start getting denser and experience more pressure. Or the combination of gases can cause waves, and the gases can collapse on themselves. Both of these processes lead to the formation of new stars. If two colliding galaxies are of the same size, many new stars are likely to form, making the galaxies shine even brighter. But if the speed of these two galaxies is too high, the newly formed stars can go right out after they appear in the sky. As two galaxies start coming closer to each other, they begin to stretch and deform, creating arms or tails. As a result, an elliptical galaxy can form, or the collision can form a new supergalaxy. In this case, stars from each galaxy will have to find a new place within this gigantic space formation. But of course, there are tons of galaxies that have never collided with others. That's because galaxies are actually relatively small targets in our gigantic universe. They form groups of small clusters where dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of galaxies gather together. Gravity holds them tight together, just like the solar system stays together thanks to the sun's gravity. Galaxies roam within these groups and clusters in a disorganized way. Naturally, collisions are bound to occur. But since galaxies are tiny, compared to all that space they live in, massive mergers don't happen often. I'm talking about those collisions between equal-sized galaxies that shake things up on a grand scale. Of all the environments galaxies can live in, the most dangerous place is a group. Because solitary galaxies, living out in the field, seldom cross paths with others. As for galaxy clusters, they are indeed crowded. But galaxies in them move at such breakneck speeds that even if two of them meet, they'll simply race past each other without any dramatic consequences. But groups of galaxies are a different story. There, galaxies move comparatively unhurriedly. It makes it more likely that two galaxies in a group will not only come close to each other, but also get caught in their mutual gravitational pull for a prolonged time. And what will happen if two galaxies come close enough to collide? Well, the best way you can imagine such events is by thinking of them as merges rather than collisions. Galaxies are very spacious, and it's more likely that the stars they contain will just pass by each other. Let's talk about a galactic collision that, according to astronomers, is going to happen in several billion years or so. And our home Milky Way galaxy is going to take part in this space event. But don't worry, we still have some time to brace for the impact. 
Interestingly, there might be not one, but two collisions. And the first one might happen around, oh, 2 billion years from now, when the Milky Way will collide with the large Magellanic Cloud. This spiral of stars and dust is floating in space about 160,000 light years away from our galaxy. And although right now this distance is totally safe and you have nothing to worry about, in approximately 2 billion years, the two celestial bodies are likely to collide. And what a view it's going to be! Imagine the Milky Way nearing the smaller galaxy. The supermassive black hole residing in the center of our galaxy will wake up and start gobbling up the stars and gas clouds of the large Magellanic Cloud with enthusiasm. Thanks to this new food source, the hole will grow way bigger than it is now. It might even turn into a quasar, one of the brightest things you can find in the universe. Our newly awakened black hole will also be emitting long jets of superbright radiation. But people on Earth won't have anything to worry about. These jets won't reach our solar system. And even if powerful gravitational interactions triggered by the merger could probably fling us out into intergalactic space, the chances of this happening are slim. Like me winning the lottery. <laughs> Stars are located too far away from one another. And even such a catastrophic galactic smash-up isn't likely to jostle our solar system. Now, if our black hole does turn into a quasar, it'll be an even more breathtaking view. The thing about these celestial bodies is that their light can be up to 10,000 times brighter than the light coming from the whole Milky Way galaxy. That's why Earth's night sky might change beyond recognition. The newly born quasar will get rid of some stars and send others flying billions of miles away from their orbits. As a result, all the constellations as we know them will disappear from the sky after the familiar stars get too far away for us to see them with the unaided eye. Luckily, the chances that the Sun will get knocked out of the Milky Way are really infinitesimal. But how about the predicted collision with the Andromeda Galaxy? Will our solar system survive this catastrophe as well? Right now, the Andromeda Galaxy is nearing the Milky Way at a speed of 68 miles per second. As you may guess, it's very hard to figure out its actual speed. And until 2012, researchers weren't even sure if the collision was going to happen or not. Unfortunately, it turned out that we had to prepare for the appearance of Milkdromeda or Milkamida, a structurally new galaxy consisting of the merged Andromeda and the Milky Way. Now, on the other hand, such collisions aren't something out of the ordinary if you consider galaxies' lifespans. Besides, even though the Milky Way is home to more than 100 billion stars and the Andromeda galaxy contains about a trillion, the chances of several stars colliding during the galaxy's merge is really low. The reason is the same. Stars are located too far away from one another. For instance, the closest to our Sun star, Proxima Centauri, is more than 4.2 light-years away, which is about 30 million diameters of our Sun. In simpler terms, if the Sun was the size of a ping-pong ball, Proxima Centauri would be the size of a pea located 680 miles away, and the entire Milky Way would be 19 million miles wide. Wow! As for other stars, can you imagine ping-pong balls hanging in space every two miles? Great! Now you have a miniature model of our galaxy. Castles were cold places in times past. The stone seemed to radiate the winter chill. This is one practical reason why tapestries were hung upon castle walls, to help keep the cold out and the warmth in. But you just can't hang any old thing on castle walls. It should be beautiful, heroic, with a heavy wow factor. The ancient Greeks hung tapestries on the walls of their castle of the sky. Glorious tapestries woven of stars. All 48 constellations of the Northern Hemisphere were designed and named by the Greeks. The story of Andromeda is one such tapestry. Woven of seven constellations spread across the entire autumn sky, the story contains detailed astronomical observations preserved as highlights in the sky tapestry. It begins with the constellation Cassiopeia, queen of the oldest realm in Africa, Ethiopia. 
When the constellation Cassiopeia is on the horizon, it looks like a staircase going up to the Milky Way. Step pyramids around the world are often thought to have been inspired by the constellation Cassiopeia. In any case, Cassiopeia is a beautiful constellation, indicating that Queen Cassiopeia was also a beautiful woman. She was good-looking, but equally vain, which sets off all the dramatic action. Cassiopeia can be found in the night sky opposite Ursa Major from the North Star. Like Ursa Major, Cassiopeia circles the North Star and is a circumpolar constellation. A supernova was observed in Cassiopeia around 1680 Earth time. Cassiopeia A having occurred about 11,000 years earlier. The Chandra X-ray satellite recently recorded an extraordinary photograph of this supernova remnant showing the elements sulfur, calcium, silicon, and iron amid the expanding cloud's high-intensity X-rays. Cassiopeia's husband is also a circumpolar constellation, a minor, dim one named Cepheus. He had his own kingdom. A merger of empires by way of marriage is something common throughout history. Cepheus was a king of Phoenicia. There were many kings of Phoenicia back in the days when Phoenicia was just a collection of city-states along the western shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Cepheus can be found in the area between Cassiopeia and the North Star. The constellation of Cepheus is important to astronomers. It's where Henrietta Swan Leavitt discovered variable stars that pulsed at regular intervals. The rate of pulsation of the star indicates the true brightness of the star and enables a sure measurement of the distance to the star. The discovery of Cepheid variable stars was a major breakthrough for early 20th century astronomy. Cepheus and Cassiopeia had a daughter, Andromeda, also a noted beauty, about whom all the fuss is. It seems that one day Cassiopeia was boasting about the beauty of her and her daughter Andromeda. We are more beautiful than any other women in the whole wide world. Well, such pretension can be forgiven for a queen. But then Cassiopeia went further and stepped beyond all natural bounds. In fact, we are more beautiful than any of the Nereids. Well, the Nereids were Greek mythological sea nymphs, daughters of the ocean. Noted for their beauty and kindness to sailors, the Nereids, all 50 of them, took offense at being diminished, dissed, by a mere mortal woman. Cassiopeia had to be punished for exceeding the bounds of the civil order. By her excessive vanity, Cassiopeia transgressed beyond the bounds of nature, for which an unnatural punishment was inflicted upon the entire kingdom of Ethiopia. A monster from the bottom of the ocean, the constellation Cetus, began to devastate the coastal villages of Ethiopia as well as Ethiopia's fishing ships. Fittingly, Cetus is a constellation of the southern celestial hemisphere. The fourth largest by area of all the constellations, Cetus swims in a dark part of the sky called the ocean, with only its head rising above the celestial equator. This part of the sky contains several water-themed constellations – Pisces, the fishes, Aquarius, the water-bearer, and Eridanus, the river. Over 50 exoplanets have been discovered in Cetus. You can bet the James Webb Space Telescope will have a field day analyzing the spectra of these planets' atmospheres, looking for signs of life. Meanwhile, Queen Cassiopeia and King Cepheus must do something about the monster devastating the shores of Ethiopia. They consult an oracle and make another trespass beyond the realm of reason and nature. Tell us, oracle, what can we do to stop the monster from ravaging our kingdom? This monster is not a normal affliction of nature. An offense was committed against the higher realms, and this is the punishment. The monster cannot be stopped by any normal means. Only a human sacrifice of the noblest being may placate the beast. One error compounds another. The noblest person in the kingdom, of course, is Princess Andromeda. According to the command of her father and the consent, or perhaps a suggestion of her mother, Andromeda is chained to a rock offshore. She is the human sacrifice that her parents hope will save the kingdom. Wow. Da -da -da -da. Here comes the Greek hero to save the day, stop the human sacrifice, and turn Cetus to stone. Perseus. Now, where is Perseus coming from? According to legend, the Hebrides. Perseus went to the Hebrides in pursuit of the Gorgon Medusa. The geological scope of this tapestry is incredible. 
From the Hebrides to the Red Sea, the Hebrides are an archipelago of mostly rocky islands off the western coast of Scotland. It was impossible to sail any further. The Hebrides were the absolute end of the world. Perseus didn't have to sail to the Hebrides. However, he flew on a pair of winged sandals. Hey, way to go, Perseus! Now, Medusa was one of the all-time baddies. One look at Medusa was so terrifying it would petrify you, literally turn you to stone. Perseus was in great danger. So, what did our hero do? Instead of looking at Medusa, Perseus used the scientific principle of reflection. He slew Medusa by seeing her reflected in his polished shield. In our sky tapestry, Perseus is portrayed holding up the severed head of Medusa. In the night sky, one eye in Medusa's head opens and closes and opens again. Arabic astronomers named the star Algol, the ghoul. Algol is an eclipsing double star. One star is bright, the other one, not that much. As the dimmer star orbits the bright star, it passes in front of the bright star, eclipsing it, and the eye closes. Since the dim star takes 2 days, 20 hours, and 49 minutes to orbit the bright star, the eye in Medusa's head opens every day and a half or so. The constellation of Perseus is immediately below Cassiopeia, and sky watchers quickly look to see if Algol is eclipsed, if Medusa's eye is open or closed. Perseus flew back from the Hebrides, accompanied by Pegasus, the winged horse. The central part of Pegasus is the great square, made up of four stars. As Earth goes around the Sun, the great square is right in the center of the night sky in autumn. In the summer, the summer triangle of Vega, Deneb, and Altair are in the middle of the night sky. In spring, it's Leo the lion, and in winter, it's Orion the hunter. These are the walls of the castle in the sky, and all have marvelous tapestries adorning them. The constellation of Andromeda shares a star named Alpharetz with Pegasus. It's one of the corners of the great square, so it appears Andromeda may be riding on Pegasus. Her crown, remember she is a princess, is floating nearby. M31, the Andromeda galaxy. To see M31, cross the corners of the great square from the lowest star to the uppermost star, and then go a little further to see the Andromeda galaxy. Be sure to peek at it from the corner of your eyes. It's called averted vision. The corners of your eyes are more sensitive to light, so you'll be able to see the huge spiral galaxy 2.5 million light years away as a smudge of light one and a half times wider than the full moon. Now, Perseus doesn't go in for human sacrifice, so he stops it and saves Andromeda by exposing Cetus to Medusa's gaze. And here we encounter the second eclipsing variable in our sky tapestry, Mira, the heart star of Cetus, the sea monster. Mira, from which we get the English word mirror, so fitting in a story about vain beauty, is an eclipsing double star. The dim star orbiting the bright star is a white dwarf, not bright enough to see with the unaided eye. The effect is that Cetus's heart shuts off. Mira is eclipsed and disappears. This cycle repeats itself every 332 days. Our fabulous star tapestry has the only two eclipsing binary stars visible to unaided eyes the nearest spiral galaxy, and a hero that doesn't like human sacrifice and uses the scientific principle of reflection to thwart mythological monsters. Wow, I would hang that in my castle too. Just saying. So you're driving down the highway, and an 18-wheel tractor-trailer is coming up fast behind. You've got to change lanes. You look in the mirror, is there enough space? And you notice the words on the mirror, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. No kidding! Well, it's the same with the Milky Way galaxy. There's another galaxy headed this way, and like the tractor trailer, it's closer than it looks. The Andromeda galaxy, or M31, as it was labeled originally by Charles Messier in his catalog of 110 fuzzy objects in 1774, is now officially named NGC 122. That's New Galactic Catalog 122. A spiral galaxy larger than the Milky Way the Andromeda galaxy is so big and so close that you can see it without a telescope. In fact, it appears with the unaided eye half as wide as the moon. It's estimated that the Andromeda galaxy contains 1 trillion stars, compared with the Milky Way's estimated 300 to 400 billion measly stars. To see the Andromeda galaxy, you must allow your eyes to become dark-adapted. 
This might take about 10 minutes while your pupils dilate to take in as much light as possible. M31 is best seen from late summer through winter, when the great square of Pegasus the winged horse is overhead. Draw a line across the great square diagonally upwards from the lower corner star, then go a little further beyond the square. There it is! But you still won't be able to see how big it is, unless you peek at it from the corners of your eyes. If you stare straight at it, the galaxy will tend to fade away. You must use your peripheral vision to see how big the Andromeda galaxy appears. Peripheral vision, or averted vision, allows you to see light more sensitively at night, but without color. Sailors have used averted vision for centuries to see faint lights out on the ocean or on land. Aristotle used averted vision to observe star cluster M41 in Canis Major, as he described in his book Meteorologica. In a telescopic photograph, the Andromeda galaxy appears six times wider than the Moon, because with the unaided eye, we can only see the bright center of the galaxy. A telescopic photograph shows how massive M31's spiral arms really are. And this beast of a galaxy is headed our way. We are looking at a future massive collision of galaxies of, well, galactic proportions. When that happens, humanity may need to relocate to another galaxy to inhabit. Perhaps we'll go to the pinwheel galaxy in the asterism of the Big Dipper. How do we know the Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us? With a tool called a spectroscope. After the camera, the spectroscope is the most important attachment to a telescope. Oh, except for the human eye. Our eyes only see light. You don't have this big horse in your eye. You only have the light being reflected by the horse in your eyes. The same with space. We only see the light coming from there. So, if we are going to understand space, we need to understand light. And that was not an easy task for astronomers of the 19th century. The invention of the spectroscope was a big breakthrough in understanding light coming to Earth from space. With a spectroscope, Astronomers can tell which direction objects in space are moving, as well as which elements are making the light. When you hear an ambulance approaching, you hear the siren getting louder and higher. And when it passes you and goes away, you hear the siren's sound get weaker and lower. The change in pitch frequency depends entirely on the motion of the source. This is called the Doppler effect, after the Austrian physicist and mathematician Christian Johann Doppler, who first explained the effect in 1842. The ambulance siren is not changing its volume. The sound waves are being compressed as it is approaching and stretched as the ambulance recedes. The spectroscope shows that light waves show the same Doppler effect as sound waves. They are compressed as the star or galaxy is approaching us and appear stretched when it is receding. Therefore, the light from an approaching galaxy will appear slightly bluer, the blue shift, a slight increase in frequency, and the light from a receding galaxy will appear slightly redder than normal, or red shift, a slight decrease in the light's frequency. In 1929, Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble spacecraft is named, published his spectroscopic study of 46 galaxies, the light from all but one of which was red shifted, moving away. Hubble's study provided the first evidence that the universe was expanding. The farther away a galaxy was from the Milky Way, the faster it was moving away. This was also the first evidence that the universe began with a Big Bang. The one galaxy whose light was blue-shifted, moving towards the Milky Way, was M31, the Andromeda galaxy, the closest galaxy. 250,000 miles per hour seems a pretty high speed at which to have a collision. That's the speed spectroscopic measurements of the blue shift of Andromeda indicate. It's going to be a big mess when it happens. But when is it going to happen? To determine when the two galaxies will collide, we need to determine the distance between them. And for that, we need, boom, supernovas. Type 1a supernovas are what are called standard candles. Just as we know how bright a candle shines, we know how bright a type 1a supernova shines, its absolute magnitude. A type 1a supernova appears when a white dwarf collapses under the pressure of all the gas it has been gravitationally slurping from a companion star. Looking at the Andromeda galaxy and measuring the apparent brightness of a supernova in the galaxy, it is possible to calculate its distance away from us. Because the intensity of light dims inversely with the square of its distance away, which is called the inverse square law, 
by comparing the apparent brightness of a supernova in the Andromeda galaxy with its absolute brightness, well, we get an approximate distance of 2.5 million light years. Since one light year is approximately 6 trillion miles, and the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away, even though it is approaching at the speed of about 250,000 miles, we have about 4 billion years before the big collision. So you can wait until after lunch, maybe dinner, to start packing. As an aside, if we see the Andromeda galaxy as it was 2.5 million years ago, and it has been moving toward the Milky Way all this time, how big in the sky would it appear now? Quite as big as that tractor trailer in your rearview mirror. But do we really have 4 billion years before the galaxies crash? There are several other factors to consider. The minor galaxies that are gravitationally linked to both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy will be swallowed up by their host galaxies. Considering the lopsided mass distribution that will result, the galactic collision of the Milky Way and Andromeda will be affected. Some scientists are saying it won't be a direct hit, but more of a sideswipe. And then there's the galactic halos of each galaxy. Here's what Project Amiga has found out about the halo of stars and gas surrounding the Andromeda galaxy. Using the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were able to observe how the light from bright distant quasars were being absorbed by the mostly invisible gas around the Andromeda galaxy. Look at the results! Notice M31 in the center. If the same is true of the Milky Way, and there's no reason to think it would be different, then the halos of the two galaxies are touching now. The collision has already begun. There is also a question about what effect the dark matter clouds around each galaxy might have on an impending collision, or are having now. But enough of speculation. In 4 billion years, the Sun will have increased brightness on its way to becoming a red giant star. And humans will have already found another galaxy to inhabit. Happy traveling, dear humans! <laughs>